these people that, uh, I mean, somebody that might be doing this, Janice uh, opens her Bible and she has the reading, uh, somebody's reading it while you know, at the same time. And somebody that can go through those lists and pronounce those names, is, uh, they, they practice to be able to do that. Maybe that's when you ought to use the Blue Letter Bible and let it, let it narrate it. in the Gaza, on the north part of the Gaza Strip. Uh, I mean, this whole area, you're over here in what would be here Philistine territory. Gaza is right in this area right here. It's just a little bitty piece of land right here. And then you got the, uh, what is the West, uh, West Bank, East Bank over here. And the Palestinians have that, and they have this. Deuteronomy, Lord willing, today. This section, this is uh, his uh, last speech here. And <coughs> it's pretty much, I hate to say this, but it's pretty much saying the same thing in a lot of different ways. He's giving the warning and telling them what's going to happen if you don't obey the Lord. Here's what the Lord's going to do to you. But at the very end, just like the prophets, you know, if you'll repent and come back, then the Lord will forgive. And uh, he has, I had somebody say to me one time, uh, that's God's business to forgive. That's not true. That's not true. Forgiveness is a gift. God doesn't owe us. God created us in a right relationship with himself, and when we broke that relationship from that point on, God doesn't owe us anything. And so anything that we get from that point, uh, up to that point, life is a gift from God. And so uh, we just need to be really careful, I think, sometimes people think that they can uh, put God in this box and tell God what he can and can't do, and God doesn't fit in a box. Uh, chapter 29 starts out, these are the words of the covenant the Lord uh, commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Okay, Moab is where? Yeah, A M E Syria Where is Horeb? What is Horeb? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. So, this is a renewal of that covenant. He's reminding them of one more time. Uh, and now it's really down to finally, finally, they're going to get.
get to cross over into the promised land. And so God has Moses sit down one last time. And I think about if you had the opportunity to speak to your your descendants, your children, and you knew that your days were within within days that you were going to die, what would you say to them? And by the way, I have given you that opportunity with that little sheet that I gave you to prepare your own funeral. And I've told you that you can have the last word. <laughs> and you can write something that will be read at your funeral for your children. And I want you to know that there'll never be another time like it. And so I, I, I recommend to you that you fill that thing out and put it somewhere, either give it to me and I'll put it in the file or give it to somebody in your family so that they'll, that you think's gonna outlive you and uh, you know, prepare, uh, have something to say to them. Uh, that, that's a meaningful time when you can do that. I need more sheets of paper. Pardon? I need more sheets of paper. You got that's lots fine. to say? Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so, Moses called all Israel, verse 2, and said to him, You've seen all the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, under Pharaoh, and his servants, and his land. And he goes on and rehearses again their background, what the Lord has done for them. You want to pick that thermostat down just a not hot? Yeah, huh? hot. I'm trying to get him to do that while I do it. Yeah, you can't really do So the covenant in verse 9, keep the words of the covenant, do them that you may prosper in all you do. And so the covenant is being renewed one more time before they go cross into the promised land. And uh, verse 12, then you should enter into the covenant with the Lord and into his oath which the Lord your God makes with you this day. So there's a, a renewal of the covenant here. Uh, and he's going to say, verse 29 is one of those verses that gets quoted fairly regularly. I have it highlighted in my Bible. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. So there are some things that God does that uh, he doesn't tell. And we just have to trust God that he knows what he's doing and he does the right thing. There's some secret things that belong to God and we don't know. And we accept by faith. Yes, sir. Well, what about verse 5? Does that mean they wore the same clothes the other 40 years? Yes, sir. Well, you know, they may have had it. I'm not saying that they didn't have two pair of shoes. I don't know. But when they came out of Egypt, they got stuff, too. So, But whatever they had didn't wear out. Well, my, my uh, and they said, waxes, you know, waxes. Yeah, mine does, too. Grows. Grows. Didn't grow. It didn't uh, grow old. Did not grow old. this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this 
book. And the Lord rooted them out of the land in anger and in wrath and great indignation and cast them uh, into another land as it is this day. So there, there is a hypothetical uh, discussion that's taking place. And the question is in verse 24. Why did this, men are going to say, why did this happen? And then he's going to give the response in verse 25 through 28. So I just put little quotations around that so that it would stand out that uh, this is a hypothetical question. And of course, it's going to come to pass, right? We know that that's going to, that's going to be the case. Any other comments in chapter 29? started back and tell them, you know, here's what God's done for you. you know. When they turn around and do it, and then respond and come back, and then turn around and do it again. That's the whole Old Testament. I know that's the preacher. That's the Old Testament. You would think they would learn from the past. Yeah, but we don't. I was just going to say, I don't think that we always learn from the past. If there's one thing that we learn from history, that happening right now on our college campuses. Right? Oh, right. <laughs> anyway, I didn't mean to stop that. Doesn't it seem to be about 40 years or something between college and college? Yeah, you know, usually you're looking at a generation. Uh, chapter 30. He promises good things that will happen to them if they uh, do what the Lord tells them to. And I want to focus on, let's read a little bit of this. Uh, let's start in verse 7, because I want to work down to a verse, and I want to show you something interesting. In chapter 30, verse 7, The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on them that hate you, which persecute you, and you shall return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you this day. And this is, once you've been in the captivity and Turn to the Lord, and He'll bring you back, and this is what will happen to you. And the Lord your God will make you plenty in every work of your hand, the fruit of your body, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land, for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, as He rejoiced over your fathers. If you hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God to keep His commandments, His statutes, which are written in the book of the law, this book of the law, and if you turn unto the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so, loving the Lord your God and turning to him with all your heart and soul, mind, strength is not new to the New Testament, mm -hmm. right? And you have, sometimes you have a full quote of that in the Old Testament, sometimes you'll have heart, what does it say, your heart and soul. But verse 11 is where I want you to look at. It says, For this commandment which I command you this day, it is not hidden from you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who shall go up to heaven for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea. What is the it he's talking about? Look at it. What is the it? The what? The commandment that I give you. This commandment I give you. It's, you don't have to send somebody up to heaven to get it. He says, it's not beyond the sea that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word, this commandment I give you, is very near unto you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart that you may do it. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? Turn over, hold your finger right there and turn over to Romans chapter 10. What? Romans chapter 10. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting because when we run across this this is going to be quoted in the New Testament when we run across it in the New Testament for 
some reason, it seems really difficult for people to understand. Yeah. But when you go back and see the context in which we just saw it, we can understand what he said back there, right? He said, I have just delivered you a message, and it's right here. You don't have to send somebody far off up to heaven to get it or anywhere else to get it. It's right here. And so we come to Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. Uh, let's go, let's, let's read, start in verse 1. Brethren, my heart desire and prayer for Israel that they might be saved. I bear them record they have a zeal to God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness. Now, that, that speaks volumes right there. Right? <coughs> I mean, all that we've talked about in Romans and Galatians is summed, summed up right there in that little phrase. Righteousness is a gift from God. But the Jews and anybody else who thinks that you can earn any part of your righteousness, it says they go about to establish their own righteousness. He says, but they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. How did you submit to the righteousness of God? By faith. Not by earning any portion of it. But by faith. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law. Okay? Now we've got a context for what he's about to say that the man that does these things will live by them. That's how the righteousness from law comes. you got to keep it. And you got to keep it all. And you have to keep it all perfectly. And you have to keep it all perfectly all the time. But the righteousness, which is a faith, speaks on this wise. <coughs> Do not say in your heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ to the above. Now he just gave you an explanation of the application of this, right? The don't say who shall ascend into heaven. That's a quote from what we just read, right? And he's talking about the message that God wants them to understand. You don't have to, you don't have to send to heaven. And then it's going to make an application. That is to bring Christ down from above. You don't have to go get Christ and have him come back and explain this to you. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Here's what it says. The word is near you, even in your mouth, in your heart. And that's a quotation that we just read, right? That is the word of <coughs> faith which we preach. And so now when you come to that context in Romans chapter 6, you're going to know what he's saying. He's saying, hey, what I'm commanding of you is not something that you have to have somebody come and explain something to you. It's <coughs> right here. I put it in your heart put it in your mouth. It's right here. It's, it's, it's plain. And so you, it's not a complicated thing that you have to have somebody come and uh, Christ to come back and explain all this to you. It's right here. And so I, I find that really interesting that when you run across something, there are lots and lots of things in the New Testament, as you well know, that are quotations from the Old Testament. And when you run across something that is a quotation from Old Testament, go back to the Old Testament and read it and look at the setting in it. And there's a lot of the Psalms, the many, many, many Psalms are quoted in the New Testament. If you'll go back and read that whole Psalm, you'll understand what the writer is saying in the New Testament a lot better. Whenever, if, whenever a writer was writing to the Jews and he quoted a section of a Psalm, then it didn't just apply when the Jews knew the whole song, and they knew the context of it. And so they got a message whenever a psalm is quoted in the New Testament, they got a much fuller message than what we get if we just take it at surface value. You know, does that make sense to you? And so go back and read that psalm where the quotation is, and you're going to understand what he's saying in the New Testament a lot better. But if we just read it, just like what we just read in Romans chapter 6, you, you, you might really not understand what he's saying, but go back and put it in a context. What was he saying here? He was saying, I've given you this command. It's right
right here. You don't have any excuse. You don't have to have something elaborate to take place for you to understand. It's right here. Right? There's an old phrase I don't recall. It doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's there. It's right here. And we can understand it. If, you know, maybe some of us have been taught that we can't understand it. But we can understand it. If we'll study for ourselves. And reading and studying through the Old Testament gives you an incredible appreciation for the New Testament when we get that. All right. Any comment, question, criticism, or observation about that? <coughs> I just really, that's one of the passages that people struggle with in Romans. It's what does he mean by you don't have to go up and bring Christ down or you don't have to go below and bring him up. What does that mean? You know, why did he put that in there? He's saying the message is plain. It's simple. It's, it's easy for you to understand. And so that's the message that he's saying in Romans 6. All right? Can we finish this this chapter on that? Yeah. Can. Yeah. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart. See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. And that I commanded you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways. And this is, he set before him life. This is the life that he set before him. To keep his commandments and his statutes, his judgment, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land where you go to possess it. And now he's going to set before you death and evil. But if in your heart you turn away, so that you will not hear, but you be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and that you shall not prolong your days on the land, whether you go to possess it over Jordan, to go possess it. And I call heaven and earth to record this day, to record against you uh, this day, that I have set before you life and death, blessing curse. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your seed may live, and that you may love the Lord. That, and here is one, two, three things that he said. Number one, that you may love the Lord your God, and that you may, too, obey his voice. And number three, that you may cleave to him, a hold to him, for he is thy life. Underline that little phrase. He is may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. So, <clears throat> this is, uh, again, I don't know how many times he will put this in such, in, in these terms, over and over again, setting before you life and death. He's going to, when they get in that land, they're going to have evil and years, blessings get there, they're going to say every time he says, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Everybody's going to say amen. He's going to repeat them. Everybody's going to say amen. And they're going to renew that covenant again. So this is, uh, there is a contingency on the land. You will possess this land as long as you do this. I will be your God if you will be my people. But if you quit being my people, guess what? I'm going to quit being your God. And if you obey me, then you will have these blessings. If you disobey me, you're going to have these curses. And the land was given on a contingency. If you do, if you don't obey me, then you're going to be cast out of it.
think all of this is just a type. The promised land is a type of what? Heaven. Right? That we're going to be given that land. We're, we're wandering in the wilderness right now, aren't we? And the Lord, the Lord delivers us, and we're his people, so there's hardship in the wilderness. Sounds like a sermon. talking about to say if you believe in your heart confess with your mouth and believe in your heart yeah yeah and when we studied through romans uh, i reminded everybody regularly that the word believe and faith is the same word right so uh, not everyone that saith unto me lord lord but here is keeping right so not it's not just a matter of You're right. That, that's one of the verses that uh, people quote to say all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ in your heart as your personal Savior. You got your ticket punched forevermore. But we pardon. There's more to it. There's more to it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that summarizes what we do if we understand what He's saying. We will be saved. I mean, I, I think you say it. Well, I didn't mean to go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody had something on that. All right. Chapter 31. Moses spoke these words unto all Israel. He said to them, I'm 120 years old this day. And I don't think today was his birthday. <laughs> At this point, I'm 120 years old. I can no more does that mean he's got weak? No. How do you know that? How do you know it? Was it? Strong. it was as strong as it was before. His strength was not diminished. That's right. That's going to be. That's going to be in in the, what chapter thirty? Yeah, chapter thirty-four, verse seven. Moses was one hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, and his natural force was. So, when he says I can't go out and come in anymore, it's not a lack of ability. It is that God said, here's the key. We're going we're to bring, bring your part of this to an end. So, he's not going to have that freedom to go out and come in anymore. He realizes that. So, here, you know, this we're getting down to the end of Deuteronomy. He's had a lot to say to them to remind them about what has happened and what will happen and how they're conduct themselves and to not be afraid and so forth. And all those things. And now it comes down to some real personal, real personal things there. He said, the Lord, your God, uh, he will go over before you. He will destroy those nations from before you. Uh, you'll possess them. Joshua, he'll go over before you as the Lord has said. The Lord shall do unto them as he did to Sihon and Og, king of the Amorites, to, the land, to their land whom he destroyed. And the Lord will give them up before your face that you may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. How many times has that been said? Right. Do not be afraid for the Lord your God. He that does go with you, he will not fail you nor forsake you. You think that's still true? The Lord wants you to do something. That charge is still true today. Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, 
be strong and of good courage. You must go with this people unto the land which the Lord swore unto their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is, it is he that goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. And now verse 9 says, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests. So this is one of the places that we go to say that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, right? Because that's what is considered the law and the prophets. That's the way that the Jews divided <coughs> the Old Testament. He delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 10, and Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, Feast of Tabernacles. When Israel is come to appear before the Lord in the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So every seven years, they're going to stand at the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And that, what was the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles? Do you remember? That's right. They because they lived in booths. They went outside their cities, but they lived in the city, and they built huts out of <coughs> branches. And they lived in that as a reminder of the fact that they were in the wilderness for all this period of time and remind them of what God had done for them. And so during that particular ceremony, on the seventh year, they were to read this law. They were to hear that. And so it will be on their hearts and in their minds and near them. So he says, uh, gather all the people together, men, women, children, stranger within your gates, they may hear what, and they may learn to fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land where you go over Jordan to possess it. And you can cross-reference your Bible, I won't go there, but you can cross-reference Bible of Judges chapter 2 verse 10 right there. You can go there for yourself. And then he gives them a final charge. And he says, beginning in verse 14, the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, your days approach that you must die. Call Joshua present yourselves in the tabernacle of congregation and that I will give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of congregation. The Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud of clouds stood over the door of the tabernacle. And so here's in the sight of all Israel, here's Moses and Joshua at the door of the tabernacle, the cloud of the Lord, the Shekinah, which is a representation of God, is there over their head, and this charge is given. So everybody will know what? Joshua is your man. Joshua is your man. We're making it, we're transferring now. And so he says, Moses, he said, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you'll sleep with your fathers, and this people will rise up, and here's what they're going to do. They'll prostitute themselves after other gods, they'll be strangers in the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. And you think, oh no, surely not. <laughs> right? <coughs> the same song, what verse? anger shall be kindled against them in that day. I'll forsake them. I'll hide my face from them. They'll be devoured with many evils and troubles shall befall them. They'll say in this day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Duh. And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have uh, done. And in that they are turned to other, other gods. Now therefore write this song for you teach it to the children of Israel. Now, if you want to know what the song is, go to chapter 10 and put start putting quotes. The song starts in chapter, I said 10, chapter 32, verse 1. This is the song. And it goes to chapter 30, 
7 through 18, he's going to give the indictment in detail. Exactly what, what they'll do and what's going to happen. And then in verse 19 through 25, he's going to pass sentence on what they've done. And by the way, chapter, verse 21 is a quote, Romans chapter 10, verse 19 is going to quote uh, chapter 20, I mean verse 21. I will provoke them to anger uh, with, by, by those that are not of people. He's going to say, people of a strange language are going to teach you something. And what that means is, I'm going to send you into exile. And you're going to be where you don't, you don't understand what these people are saying around you. And you're going to learn a lesson. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And then verse uh, 26 through 43 is a promise of mercy. If you'll repent, come back to me. I'll forgive you. So, here's the outline again, if you want it. Witnesses in verse 1 through 3. 4 through 6, he makes the charge. 7 through 18 is the indictment in detail. And I'll leave my Bible here if you want to come up and get it after me. Then verse 19 through 25, the sentence. Then 26 through 43 is the promise of mercy. In verse 39, I find I, there are several, a lot of things in this song here. I don't know if they put this to music or not. But anyway, they did. It's a long song. But verse 30, he says, See now that I, even I, am he, that there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound. find that an interesting verse. Don't you? And then in chapter 33, he gives uh, each one of the tribes, he's going to say something about them. Verse 6, Reuben, let Reuben live. Verse 7, this a blessing of Judah. Verse 8, Levi, of Levi, he said, so and so. Verse 12, Benjamin. Verse 13, is Joseph. Verse 18, is Zebulun and Issachar. Verse 20, uh, 20 is Gad. 22 is Dan, 24 is Asher. So he gets all the tribes and he gives a blessing to them. And then verse chapter 34, Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah. Uh, the mountain is Nebo, Pisgah is evidently a peak on that mountain. And there is over against Jericho. So it's in that area where the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan. Now, why does it say Dan? Dan is a very northern city. From, from Dan to what? Remember what the other one's name is? Beersheba. From Dan to Beersheba, that's from north to south. So he let him see all of the land uh, from, from that point. And all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, the Manasseh, the land of Judah, to the utmost city. In the south, the plains of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, and to Zor. And the Lord said to him, This is the land in which I swear unto Abraham. Now, this has to be an emotional time. Do you think that, I mean, couldn't possibly have seen all that. God must have, must have given him some kind of. Well, he revelation. very well may have, but that's, it's not that far. It's not as. You can't, you can't see. <laughs> well, you can, on a clear day, you can see a long way. All right. I'd like to think the Lord took him around and showed him that. Well, that's the way I look at it. Me and you talked right. about that. And maybe that's my Yeah, I don't know if he it. took him around or gave him x-ray vision. Right. <laughs> One way he saw it. Yeah. And 
he said, the Lord said to him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, saying, I will give it unto your seed. I have caused them to see it. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. I hope it was a, not a painful death, don't you? I want to make sure it's easy. Probably just went to sleep. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knows his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, till the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, now we're setting the stage for Joshua, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. You don't read that many times, do you? And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And that's emotional to even read that, my brother. You know? And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his servants and all his land, and in all that mighty hand, and all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Bless his heart. He didn't, ask for, he didn't ask for the job to start with, did he? <laughs> is it a shame to say, it is I think Bashan. <laughs> it's the same as what? It's the same city as uh, Beersheba. I think that Bashan is the territory. It's like Moses called them all the way. From the time he took them to show them, they were talking to him and he got it. They got it. 40 yeah. years. <laughs> yeah. And <coughs> how old was he when he started this journey? 80. He was 80 years old when he started. Obviously. So, 40 years, the last 40 years of his life. He was 120 years old and he was still strong. Man. I just think he was so discouraged right there at death, even because God said, Look, they're going to still keep on doing it. Yeah, I know. I know. That, that had to be a difficult, but for his own personal life. Here's where you're going to go. Right. Uh, you know, it's better than going into that land, but I have to admit, I would like for him to have gone over and been able to eat a few grapes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he would be a great guest speaker. Wouldn't he? He will be. He will be. You don't get to talk to him. Yeah. All right. Thank you, and we'll pick up with Joshua next time.